Good morning, church. Uh, so glad you can join us this day. Uh, unfortunately, some uh, plans have changed. We uh, were recording the service on the camera, but the camera went shot. It went dead, kaput. So I am doing this uh, brief devotional sermon so that you can have at least some form of worship today with God's word. But we truly apologize that uh, we could not get the whole service and uh, allow you to participate in worship in that way. So uh, please excuse, uh, pardon our, uh, pardon our uh, technical difficulties, and we apologize for any inconvenience. Today's word was on the book of Philippians. As you know, we're in the book of Philippians this uh, time, and it is Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses, I'm going to read um, verse 21 through 23. So chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, and then go into chapter 2. So let's read this together. Chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two, my desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. And then in chapter 2, I want you to pick it up at verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 11. Chapter 2. <clears throat> do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as yourselves, better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, to the point of death, even death and the cross. Therefore God so highly exalted him and gave him the name that was above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This past week, as you know, we, saw, we observed 19 years of the September uh, 11th uh, attack uh, from those three planes that were uh, abducted and, and used as weapons against our own country. It reminds me of my time uh, that I spent in New York back in 1995. I went to New York to do a pre-college program. It was a five-week program in a college, Parsons School of Art and Design in Manhattan. And the, the goal was to see if, that, see if college in Manhattan would be right for me. This was right before my senior year in high school. So over the summer, I packed my things. I went to be with my grandma in Staten Island. And from Staten Island, I would commute to Manhattan every day uh, to go to art class and to go to this pre-college program for five weeks. It was about a 45-minute commute one way. It was two trains and a ferry. And, uh, you know, I was kind of a slower-paced, kind of mellow guy. So being in New York was a bit difficult. I'd get up in the morning. I'd get on the train. You know, you're on the train. Don't talk to anyone. It's too early to talk to anyone. So you get on the train, ride the train to the ferry. Then you get to the ferry terminal, and people at the ferry terminal would be ready to go. They would be at the ferry doors, the ferry terminal doors. I kind of meandered in and sat and just waited for the ferry. You know, the ferry wasn't going to go any faster if you uh, rushed onto the ferry. But sure enough, the ferry terminal doors would open. The ferry would be there docked, and people would rush off to the ferry. So we'd take our 20-minute ferry boat, Staten Island ferry boat, across the water to Manhattan. Then again, Manhattan, you got to walk. you got to walk. You know, you can't make eye contact. You can't talk to other people. you got to walk. Get to where you're going. Get on a train. You can't make eye contact. Don't smile at anyone. If you smile at someone, they'd say, what, you got a problem with me? And then if you hold the door for someone, they'd say, what, I can't hold the door myself? So you just walk. You'd walk. And you don't make eye contact, and that was New York. It was like truly the rat race. And, and I remember, you know, uh, you'd, you'd get up to the, to, the, uh, to the crosswalk, and you'd have to wait for the thing to turn, and then it would turn, and then you walk. And it was truly a rat race. It drove me crazy. So after that five weeks, I came home to Florida, and I told my parents, I'm not going to go to New York for school. I can't do it. You know, it's just too crazy and I can't do it. September 11th, however, happened, and things changed. I remember visiting New York shortly after September 11th, and people were looking at each other. People were taking time to help one another. Rather than not making eye contact, 
there was more of a feeling of camaraderie and more of a feeling of being united. And I remember shortly after September 11th that we as a nation were united. We came together, uh, not only to figure out what to do and how to move forward, but to also grieve together and to heal together. And you might recall that after that time, people turned to God. There was a spiritual awakening in which people went back to church, but it didn't last long. And ever since 9-11, things are slow, were slowly going back to the way things were. We no longer noticed one another or talked to one another. We no longer uh, were concerned with how others are or if you're in the street to take time and to care for others. In fact, researchers are showing that empathy in people is on the decline. One study in the University of Michigan just this last January of 2020 did a study with their incoming students and it showed a 40% decline in empathy uh, and in empathy skills for the incoming class, 40% than previous, school, previous classes. And what that is showing us is that as people get more online, as people get more into their tribal opinions and their partisan positions, as social media begins to sculpt how we think, it takes a hit on our empathy. In my thinking, there are three obstructions to empathy. The first is uh, the obstruction of, of learning empathy. You know, empathy is a learned behavior. You need to learn how to reach out to others. You need to learn how to see things from another person's point of view. You need to learn how to walk in someone else's shoes or to pray in someone else's shoes. You need to hear the stories of others and approach life in an inclusive, welcoming way so that you can get to know others. That is a learned behavior. And apparently through this hyperpartisan culture, that kind of empathy is hard to find. Another obstruction to empathy is competing values. We have values that compete within us. Uh, and uh, what I mean by this is uh, take a, a parking spot, for instance. You're driving along and you make that turn down the aisle, you see a beautiful parking spot right near the front door of the grocery store and you're driving towards that parking spot. But then another car comes up the opposite direction. Now you have competing values. On the one hand, you value that spot your back hurts, your knees hurt today, and you really need to get that close spot. So you value that spot because it's close for all the right reasons. But then you value passively being nice or being kind or letting that other car pull into the spot instead. So these competing values war within you. And empathy is the ability to negotiate those competing values. Notice it's not, you're not a terrible person if you take that spot. Your knees are bad. But at the same time, it's, not, it's also not bad to be kind and to let that person use the spot. Competing values. I used another story this morning at church about the first group of students who integrated Mercer in 1960, around 1962, 1963. Southern Baptists were sending missionaries all over the world, and as people were coming to Christ, they wanted to come back to learn in the colleges and the Baptist institutions that made ministers and missionaries. One of those was Mercer University. So from Nigeria, a group of students came and they, were, they had to rewrite the rules in Mercer in order to integrate Mercer. It was very controversial. A lot of donors, Baptist donors within Georgia, dropped Mercer out of their wills and off of their estate lists because they didn't believe in integrating the school. But this group of Africans came to integrate the school, the very first batch, about three or four students, and then one day, one of them, Sam Oney, wanted to go to the church down the street. It was the church where everyone went, college students, professors, the whole Mercer University campus went to this one church. So Sam got his Bible, he dressed in his nicest suit, and he, as an African, walked down the street. The deacons barred the doors to the church. The deacons stood hand in hand and would not let Sam into church because they believed that Sam needed to go to the black church down the street and they barred him from going. It made the news and everything. But the church had competing values. On the one hand, they wanted to value who they were, and they believed that the gospel message did not allow integration. That was a value, but also the competing value of letting this African student within their, within their congregation. Competing values obstructs empathy. Another obstruction to empathy is competition among ourselves. We compete with one another. 
If I want to get ahead in life or I want that promotion or I see success as a value, I am going to reach that goal at the expense of others. We're competing against ourselves and empathy declines as we try to get ahead, as we try to push our agenda, as we try to reach our goals. Competing values and competition against one another and the inability to learn are all obstructions to empathy. That's when we get to the book of Philippians. When Paul is writing to the colony of Philippi, a group of military Roman veterans who spent their life in competition, getting ahead, in, uh, in fighting on behalf of the Roman government, and now are able to retire in this Roman colony in order to live their life and to do things their way. And Paul found within that colony of Philippi the very things that obstructed empathy. He found their competing values where people wanted to give their life for the, their nation, Rome, but at the same time wanted to get ahead and take matters into their own hands. They wanted to sacrifice themselves. They spent a lifetime in the military uh, giving themselves for the lives of others, but then wanting to live their life and to get their way now that they were retired. They found within, Paul found within that Roman colony competition among people where people were getting ahead at the expense of others. And because of that, Paul realized that Rome was informing how this community saw empathy and it was lacking. So Paul says to the Christian church in Philippi, we live by a different set of rules. You see, when we become Christians, Jesus becomes our highest value. Jesus becomes our model for empathy. And Jesus demands that we walk with people as servants to one another rather than in competition with one another. And so Paul says right off the bat in chapter 1 that we are to love each other mutually. And then he goes in uh, around uh, our lesson today, verse um, 22, when he says that I value Christ so much that I don't mind dying on, uh, on behalf of my faith. I don't mind dying for Jesus if that's what Jesus calls me to. To live is Christ. To die is gain. But he admits there's competing values even within him. He says, I believe in verse 23 of chapter 1, I am hard-pressed on every side. I want to live on the one hand, and I want to die for Jesus on the other. These are competing values. But I know that if my highest value is Jesus, that I need to follow the ways of Jesus. That through all of these values that compete within us, as we are almost like walking contradictions, Jesus carves a way forward for us to, to seek the highest value, which is to follow Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And then he turns in chapter 2 to say that we need to stop competing with one another, that we are to be of the same mind, to walk together. He says in verse 3, put selfish ambition aside, put conceit aside, and humble yourselves. He, put, he says in chapter 2, verse 4, put other people's interests ahead of yourself. Why? Well, because as empathy is learned, is a learned behavior, Jesus is our model for empathy. And he says, Paul says in chapter, five, chapter, four, uh, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus, who was God, in the, who was God and who, knew, who was in the form of God, did not consider that something to be grasped or to exploit it. He says, Jesus didn't stay God in order to get ahead or to put himself first. No, he emptied himself in order to put us first, in order to serve us, in order to walk with us, in order to empathize with us, to cry with us, to laugh with us, to mourn with us, to celebrate with us, to walk in our shoes that he might give himself for us, even if it meant death on the cross. And there, as Jesus emptied himself and gave himself for us, being for us a model of empathy, he died and there God exalted him that at that day, uh, that um, on that day that every, uh, when Christ is Lord, every tongue will confess, every, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord because his name is above every name. And we are to follow in his footsteps. If Jesus placed our lives above every other value, if Jesus chose the road of empathy in order to realize how we feel, to walk like we walk, to die like we die, then Jesus is our model. Just as Jesus puts us as the most valuable, we put him 
as our most valuable goal in life, to follow him. And we look at Jesus as a model to live our life, not only to learn empathy, but to rid ourselves of those competing values because there's only one name above every name, one value above every competing value, and that is the value of the person and the character of Jesus Christ. And that we're not to compete against one another, but walk in a united mission of following Christ. You see, these soldiers to whom Paul was writing in Philippi knew a thing or two about working together. But in their retirement, they started to compete with one another. He says, now we lay aside those selfish ambitions. We lay aside our conceit. We put others' interests before ourselves, and we walk together in one mind so that we can walk together. And what Paul is basically saying is, take your training as a soldier and move from the mission of the battlefield to the mission of the heart and make your mission the mission to seek Christ as Lord and Savior, to make him your number one so that you're willing to die for him. You're willing to die and serve others for his sake, that you might empty yourself to put Jesus as Christ and Lord. On this day, I hope that uh, as we walk together, that you will follow the footsteps of Jesus. Make him your highest value among all your competing values. Follow in his footsteps to empty yourself in order to fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. That Jesus' mission may be your only mission. That you may follow Jesus to walk in the shoes of others, to pray with others, to learn how to weep with others and to laugh with others to humble yourselves and to bring, and to bring uh, our church alongside those who need us in this time of need. As we consider this lesson for today, I want you to do a homework assignment. When you're out and about this week, uh, whether it be watching the news or engaging in social media or just out and about working, try to figure out what kind of emotions pass through your heart. And I want you to keep a notebook and, and write down the different values that come to mind. For instance, if you're watching the news and you, you watch a story that makes you infuriated, what, what's your highest value? What is, what is provoking that anger that you value? Uh, if, you're, if you're in work and, and somebody uh, makes you happy, what is your, or there's an opportunity, what's your highest value there? Uh, for instance, you can be watching a story about, say, the protests, and you may value... Uh, justice. So you say, my highest value is that these people who are, who are rioting will be tried and that the, there's the, the, the property might be saved. So what's your highest value there? Or if you're watching a story, say, about uh, children who are, are uh, at, the, at the center of, uh, say, a human, uh, a human trafficking ring, you know, what's your highest value? Is it the life of those children? Uh, is, it the, is it justice? What's your highest value? But go through the different things that engage you, be it on social media, in conversation with friends, and list values, and then take those values and pray through them and ask Jesus. Say, Jesus, out of all of these competing values, what should be my highest value? What do I ha value the highest? And what are you inviting me to do this week? You, you may value justice on the one hand. Let's take our church, for instance. We value safety and security. We have beautiful doors that we put on. It. They're gorgeous. We're able to lock our facility. But that doesn't mean that we lock people out. We value safety and security, but we also value welcoming people. How do we balance those competing values? Well, we have to choose. What would Jesus do? Uh, if you're coming up to, a, 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 as I mentioned earlier, a parking spot, and you value your knees and your body and you don't want to walk that far, but then you see another car and you value kindness. The, among those competing values, what does Jesus want you to do? What is God inviting you to do this week? To move your selfish ambitions aside and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who, is, who ultimately is the one who informs what we value. I, again, I apologize for the worship today. I'm uh, filming here in the church so that you can get a sense that we're in this place together and uh, I, we're terribly sorry for the mishap but let's pray together and ask that um, God might speak to us this week and that we might heed God's invitation for how to live in a spirit of empathy and 
uh, of, of having Jesus our highest goal this week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for today, and we thank you that we worship you, and we thank you that you, that Jesus made us his highest value, so much so that he's willing to die for us. Now, Lord, as believers, may we put Jesus as our highest value, that we may push ourselves aside, follow him, and even die for him. Lord, may you be first in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. I hope that you join us online for a midweek Bible study and also our Sunday school lesson. If, in fact, if you haven't caught the Sunday school lesson yet from this morning, the September 13th one on Luke 14, I invite you to do so because it speaks to competing values, uh, one of heeding God's invitation and of including people in your life. I hope you catch it. We'll see you next week. And again, worship uh, with your household. Pray, spend time in God's word, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen.